Hello, welcome back. I am Robert, and we've been having fun talking about angels for a while now. Well, it's time to bring this conversation to an end. But we still got one big thing we need to do. We've seen this seventh angel who does all these super cool things in scripture, but he's got no name. You know, like Shakespeare said, what's in a name? Well, a lot. And the cool thing is that he actually does have a name. And when we figure out what it is, it's going to kind of, oh, oh, that's who that guy is. So did I give you enough of a teaser there? All right. So we spent our last video looking at some of the roles of the seventh angel. Now we need to look at a few of the last roles of the seventh angel. And then, like I said, then we're going to put a name to a face or a name to a name, something like that. All right. Let's get started. So we discussed the seven angels of power. In a little review, these are the seven angels who serve in God's throne room. They are seen both corporately in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. They particularly show up strong in the book of Revelation. So within the seven angels, you've got the four winds of heaven. They're always seen together as a unit of four. Next, we have Gabriel, who, scripturally speaking anyway, is recognized as the herald of God. He speaks the voice of God. He was there to announce the birth of Jesus and the coming of the Messiah. The next angel up is Michael. And remember, Gabriel and Michael are the only two angels actually named by name that we for sure know are angels. And Michael's job is to lead the armies of heaven. He confronts Lucifer two different times in scripture. So the last angel is this mystery guy that I think the vast majority of people didn't even really recognize was there. And yet, as you've seen, he's all over the place in different images, types, figures. The Old Testament speaks of his coming. The Old Testament shows him doing stuff. He definitely is there in the book of Revelation. So we want to finish up by looking at some more of his roles as well as what is his name? Here we go. So we've already shown that the seventh angel is a temple builder, as seen through Revelation 11, 4, Zechariah 4, 2, and 3, and Zechariah 4, 12 through 14. So one of the jobs of the angel in his earthly ministry, leading the bride of Christ, is to be a temple builder. The term two witnesses that's used in Revelation chapter 11 as a double meaning. So that's what we recognize or what we reference to see that uh, Zerubbabel is a type of the seventh angel in his earthly ministry. And those two people are the two witnesses. So they're seen as temple builders. The bride of Christ, one of the images that is attached to the bride is a temple, right? The temple of God. So that the two witnesses are temple builders is significant. The two witnesses, that term, has a second meaning, though. It refers to a second image about the bride of Christ. So the text from Revelation chapter 11 describes the testimony, the witness, that these two people deliver until their death. Two, to be a witness also means to be a key member of a wedding party the bridesmaid, and the best man. This should start to click into people right now because we know that the bride of Christ is referencing a wedding. The seventh angel is the best man for the wedding between Jesus and his bride. Revelation 19, 7 and 8 says, Let us rejoice and be glad and give the glory to him, Jesus, for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. It was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. So clearly one of the big references in Revelation is of a wedding, the wedding between the raptured bride of Christ and Jesus. Revelation 21.9 says, Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues came and spoke with me, saying, Come here. I will show you the bride, the wife, and the lamb. And if you remember, the book of Revelation is a conversation between 
John and between the seventh angel, my angel, his angel, who Jesus commissioned to deliver the message to John, and John was to deliver it to us, to God's people. So this one of the seven angels we're talking about here, it's actually the seventh angel. And he's telling John, I will show you the bride, the wife, and the lamb. Here's what I'm going to do for you. So the bride is the city. Scripture portrays the bride and the holy city as one and the same. So the bride is a reference for the bride of Christ for the last generation who will be raptured. The temple is a reference for the last generation, the bride of Christ. And there's a third image, and that is the city. So when we're talking about the New Jerusalem, it's the same reference for the same group of people as the bride and the temple. They're all references for that last generation who survived the tribulation, who refused to acknowledge or refused to worship the Antichrist and remain just and pure for Jesus. They're also seen as a city. So the best man at the wedding and the builder of the holy city are also seen as one and the same. So it says, Then one of the seven angels, who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues, came and spoke with me, saying, Come here, I will show you the bride, the wife, and the lamb. The rest of the verse that we did read before says this, And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain, and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. So the seventh angel tells John, I'm going to show you the bride. And then the first thing he does is he shows the city. So the bride is the city. It's just another name for that same group of people. Revelation 21, 9 through 15 says this. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues came and spoke with me, saying, Come here, I will show you the bride, the wife, and the lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain showed me the holy city Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God having the glory of God her brilliance was like a very costly stone as a stone of crystal clear jasper it had a great and high wall with 12 gates and at the gates 12 angels and names were written on them which are the names of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel there were three gates on the east and three gates on the north and three gates on the south West. And the wall of the city had 12 foundation stones, and on them were the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. The one who spoke with me had a gold measuring rod to measure the city, and its gates, and its wall. So a couple things here. You notice that uh, the city, Jerusalem, is equally part Israeli children and part church children. The two become one. One body, you're one lover of Jesus. So the other thing is the messenger. So look at the highlighted pieces. He tells John, all right, I'm going to come. I'm going to show you the bride, the wife, and the lamb. He then shows him the holy city, Jerusalem. Key piece at the end, the one who spoke with me, the angel, had a gold measuring rod to measure the city and its gates and its wall. That's important because what we're going to find out is that this same angel did the exact same thing back in the Old Testament. See a pattern of how these things shake out and how Scripture organizes things. So this is from Ezekiel 42 through 4. So you see there's a lot of cool information in Ezekiel. In the visions of God, he brought me. So this is Ezekiel talking, and he's talking about an angel who's showing him into the land of Israel and set me on a very high mountain, a structure like a city. So he brought me there, and behold, well, I'm sorry, it's God who showed me these things. Behold, there was a man whose appearance was like the appearance of bronze with a line of flax and a measuring rod in his hand. So remember the physical description of the seventh angel being like bronze, and he has a line of flax, a measuring rod in hand, just like the angel that we looked at in Revelation. And he was standing in the gateway. The man said to me, Son of man, see with your eyes, 
hear with your ears and give attention to all that I am going to show you, for you have been brought here in order to show it to you, declare to the house of Israel all that you see. So this angel is now going to show Ezekiel everything about the city. Ezekiel's job is to show it to the Israelites. Exactly the same as the angel showing John the city, and John's job is to show it to God's people. Exact same ministry. Now, if you read the rest of Ezekiel, like the last eight chapters, it's all about this angel showing this stuff to Ezekiel. Zechariah 2, 1 through 2, 3 says, Then I lifted up my eyes, and behold, there was a man with a measuring line in his hand. So I said, Where are you going? And he said to me, To measure Jerusalem, to see how wide it is and how long it is. And the angel who was speaking with me was going out, and another angel was going out to meet him. So the angel who was speaking to Zechariah, who happened to be the same angel speaking to Zechariah in chapter 4, which we looked at earlier about the temple builders, about Zerubbabel. Same angel has a measuring line in his hand. Same angel, same job, right? He is going out to measure Jerusalem, see how wide and how long it is. And remember that the true Jerusalem is God's people. So when you see how long, how wide it is, how many are in it. So, we see this angel appears in many different places, and he is the builder of the city. And this is confirmed in Isaiah 45, 13. I have aroused him in righteousness, and I will make all his ways smooth. He will build my city and will let my exiles go free without any payment or reward, says the Lord of hosts. So, this guy that's been aroused, he's come from the north, he's come from the rising of the sun, he's being aroused to build God's city. Same guy. So city builder is one of the attributes of the seventh angel. So the last generation, the seventh angel. Last generation is the temple. The seventh angel is a temple builder. Last generation is the bride. Seventh angel is the best man. He's the witness. The holy city is the last generation, and the seventh angel is the city builder. They perfectly mesh together. So the seventh angel has many titles in scripture, but does he have a name? So we've looked at what he does, now we need to find out who is he. Other figures who are given multiple names and titles in the Bible, such as Jusuf, Jusuf, that's not good, Jesus, Lucifer, and Leviathan, of specific names. Zechariah chapter 4 provides specific information which will unlock the mystery of this figure seen throughout Scripture. So remember, I told you that looking at Zerubbabel as a type of the seventh angel in his earthly ministry in Revelation 11 was going to be important because the angel, who happens to be the seventh angel, speaking to Zechariah gives important information that unlocks the identity of the seventh angel. So when you filter through it, the seventh angel is giving us information about himself to Zechariah. It's just in a very convoluted, mysterious way. But when you filter through it, that's what's going on. So we need to look at the fourth chapter of Zechariah. The words to Zerubbabel are key. This is Zechariah 4, 6. Then he said to me, so is the angel, the seventh angel, speaking to Zechariah. This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. So tell Zerubbabel, saying, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. And remember, Zerubbabel is a type. So it's speaking to Zerubbabel in his physical life but it's also prophesying to the future of the seventh angel as one of the two prophets in Revelation 11, because what happens in Zerubbabel's life will foretell or foreshadow the events of the seventh angel later. That's what a type is. And Zerubbabel is a type of the seventh angel. So he's telling him, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit. Zechariah 4, 7, right after it says, What are you, O great mountain? 
before Zerubbabel, you would become a plain, and he will bring forth the top stone with shouts of grace, grace to it. So he's going to usher in Jesus. Jesus is the top stone. And then Zechariah 4, 8, 9 says, Also the word of the Lord came to me, saying, The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house, and his hands will finish it. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. And lastly, Zechariah 4.10, For who has despised the day of small things? But these seven will be glad when they see the plumb line in the hand of Zerubbabel. These are the eyes of the Lord, which reigns to and fro throughout the earth. Remember the measuring line that's in the hand of the seventh angel? Well, we're foretelling he's going to get that plumb line, that measuring line, and the Holy Spirit, the seven eyes, are going to be happy. So Zechariah 4, 6, these verses were historically spoken to Zerubbabel, who is a type of the two witnesses, specifically of the seventh angel. These verses prophetically speak about the seventh angel in his role as one of the two witnesses. Verse 6 says, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit. The word mighty is used in conjunction with the seventh angel multiple times. You know, just one of those going back is Isaiah 28 too. So the message is telling the seventh angel that in his earthly ministry in human form, he, was, he must not rely upon his might, but rather upon the spirit, just as Jesus did. Just as Jesus, as he walked in flesh and blood and human form, he could perform nothing on his own. He had to let the Holy Spirit minister through him and perform miracles. Jesus in his humanity couldn't. It was the Holy Spirit moving through him. And that's what the angel is, I guess, telling himself down the road. Not by might. You've got to allow the Holy Spirit. You have to rely on God's Spirit. Then at Zechariah 4, 7 says, or warns the great mountain that Zerubbabel will level it to become a flat plain. Well, the great mountain is Lucifer. Remember, we looked at that one. That's why we looked at Lucifer as the great mountain, because we see Zechariah telling us that Zerubbabel and later uh, the seventh angel will flatten him, will defeat him. It says in Isaiah 14, 12, Behold, I am against you, O destroying mountain, who destroys the whole earth declares the Lord, and I will stretch out my hand against you and roll you down from the crags, and I will make you a burnt out mountain. Actually, that's Jeremiah 51, 25. This is referencing the king of Babylon who represents Lucifer, and we know that from Isaiah 14, 12. So the king of Babylon is the destroying mountain. We, we've already looked at that one. And Zerubbabel in his earthly form will defeat the plans of Lucifer. But later on in the tribulation, in the book of Revelation, you know, the seventh angel will do it as well. The second angel sounded and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea. This is Revelation 8.8. 8. So again, it's showing who that great mountain is. Now, Zechariah 4.7 says, what are you, O great mountain? So God's calling out Lucifer. Before Zerubbabel, you will become a plain. I will flatten you, and I will bring forth the top stone with shouts of grace, grace to it. In Isaiah 43 through 5, this is the great passage that we use in reference to John the Baptist. And it says, a voice is calling, clear the way for the Lord in the wilderness and make smooth in the desert a highway for our God. Let every valley be lifted up, and every mountain and hill be made low, and let the rough ground become a plain, and the rugged terrain a broad valley, then the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all flesh will see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. So, it's referencing John the Baptist, who was the one who paved the way for Jesus at his first coming, but it's the seventh angel in human form in this human ministry who will pave the way for Jesus for his second coming. And this passage is referencing both the first coming of Elijah and the second coming of Elijah. Remember, Jesus said that Elijah is coming 
and will come or has come and will come again. Jesus was telling us there's a first and a second coming of Elijah. John the Baptist, seventh angel. So the voice of the one calling in the wilderness. Malachi 4, 5 said, Behold, I am going to send you Elijah, the prophet, before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. Though John was seen as the coming of Elijah, and we know that from Luke 1, 13 through 17, this prophecy was not fulfilled in his time. The second coming of Jesus will be the great and terrible day of the Lord. His first coming was not great and terrible. It was terrible for Jesus, but not for the world. It was to give life to the world. When Jesus comes back the second time, he's coming back to deliver his people and condemn the world. That is the great and terrible day of the Lord. That didn't get fulfilled in John the Baptist. So if we're saying that Elijah is going to do that, there has to be a second coming of Elijah at the second coming of Jesus. John was the voice who prepared the way of the Lord for his first coming. The seventh angel will be the voice who prepares the way of the Lord for his second coming. And the voice of one calling in the wilderness, and if you were willing to accept it, John himself is Elijah who was to come. So we know that, Matthew eleven fifteen. Jesus is specifically saying John the Baptist was Elijah in physical form. It's not Elijah's spirit that got resurrected. He came in the spirit and power of Elijah. Elijah was a type of John the Baptist. Matthew 17, 11 through 12 says, And he answered and said, Elijah is coming and will restore all things. But I say to you that Elijah already came, and they did not recognize him, but did to him whatever they wished. So Jesus here is telling us the first and second coming of Elijah and the different purposes that each coming has. The seventh angel is the second coming of Elijah, foretold by Jesus, to prepare the way for his own second coming. Zechariah 4.10 Zechariah 4.10 says, The Holy Spirit as represented by the seven eyes. And we know that the seven eyes are the Holy Spirit from Revelation 5.6. will be happy when the plumb line is in Zerubbabel's hands to build the city. Remember the measuring line. We saw it three different times in Revelation, in Zechariah, and in the book of Ezekiel, where that same angel has a measuring line in his hands to build the city. So the seventh angel is seen measuring the city of Jerusalem three times, Revelation 21-13, Ezekiel 42-3, and Zechariah 2-1-2. He is the city builder, in from Isaiah 45-13. So Zechariah 4, 8-9 got intentionally skipped because it holds the clues for determining the name of the mysterious seventh angel. It is the last big piece of information we have to look at. The phrase, the hands of Zerubbabel will have laid the foundation of this house and his hands will finish it, is used to reference the work accomplished by the historical figure of Zerubbabel to build the second Jewish temple. But the prophetic implication refers to the seventh angel who Zerubbabel represents, who he is a type of. The house spoken of isn't a physical temple, but rather the children of God being portrayed as a temple. So Revelation chapter 7 says the last generation began with a promise to Abraham. Before that promise was made to Abraham, a figure named Melchizedek blessed Abraham with bread and it says in Genesis 14, 18-20, And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. Now he was a priest of God most high. Remember, the seven angels of the throne room are priests. It says, He blessed Abraham and said, Blessed be Abram of God most high, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. He gave him the tenth of all. So, Abraham gave a tenth of what he had to Melchizedek. In Genesis 14, 18, 18 to 20, we look at Melchizedek as a priest of God. Revelation 14, 5, 
Melchizedek was called a priest of God most high. We already know that the seventh angel is consecrated, Isaiah 13, 3, as a priest and serves in the temple of God in heaven, which we see in Revelation 14, 5. So, to get the best portrait of Melchizedek, we have to look at Hebrews 7, 1 through 4. It says, For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham as he was returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham apportioned a tenth part of all the spoils, was first of all, by the translation of his name, king of righteousness, and then also king of Salem which is king of peace, without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life. He can't be human if he doesn't have those things, but made like the son of God. So he can't be God because he's made like the son of God. It's a comparison between two things, Melchizedek and Jesus. Melchizedek is made like Jesus, but he isn't Jesus. He remains a priest perpetually. So again, he lives on eternally. He is immortal. He's not human. So if you're not human and you're not God, there's really only one answer left. you got to be an angel. It says, then the patriarch gave uh, Melchizedek a tenth of the choicest spoils. This is Hebrews 7, 1 through So the text in Hebrews makes it clear, Melchizedek is not a man, having no mother or father or having neither beginning nor end of days, he is immortal. Nor is he God, one made like the Son of God can't be God. So he must be an angel, either a fallen angel or a servant of the light, or a fallen angel or a servant of the light, but the text clearly indicates he's a servant of the light. By process of elimination, Melchizedek must be an angel. So Melchizedek's role. Just as John came in advance to prepare the way for Jesus, so too did Melchizedek. Because Melchizedek introduced the elements of the Eucharist, the bread and the wine, as a forerunner of Christ's body and blood that were shed on the cross. So the act of Melchizedek was as a type pointing the way toward Jesus later on. Therefore, the Melchizedek priesthood is named after Melchizedek, but Jesus is the fulfillment of the Melchizedek priesthood, as described in the book of Hebrews. So the fact that Melchizedek is like the Son of God, that's the key to everything here. Melchizedek is the only being besides Jesus who carries the dual titles of both king and and priest. Nobody else but Jesus and Melchizedek have this. Based on the text in Daniel chapter 10 and Revelation chapter 1, Jesus and the seventh angel, Melchizedek, bear a remarkable physical appearance or physical resemblance. The earthly ministry of each figure is remarkably similar as well. Each left heaven to occupy an earthly body. And each will or did minister for 3.5 years. Each was or will be killed, then was or will be raised to life. Both are attributed with saving the children of God. Both Jesus and Melchizedek, the seventh angel, are attributed with saving the children of God. And we know that from Isaiah 63, 8, 9, which you've already read. And the angel of his presence saved them. So, Melchizedek is the angelic being who Jesus described in Revelation as my or his angel. And you can see why there is a special, unique, close relationship between these two. Melchizedek seems to bear the closest relationship with Jesus of any other created being. Just as when Jesus walked the earth, he was closest to the apostle John. Melchizedek is the seventh angel of the throne room who will, come to the, who will come at the end of the age to deliver the children of God from the hand of Satan. So, what have we learned? Seventh angel, he appears throughout scripture. 
He is the leader of the angels. He will come in earthly form to prepare the children of God to meet Jesus at the rapture. His name is Melchizedek. All right, well, I think that was fun. And we closed up, we brought closure to a great mystery. Lots of people have asked who is Melchizedek. Nobody was asking who the seventh angel is because I don't think anybody really recognized he was out there. Now we know that these two great mysterious figures are actually one and the same. And like I said, he's all over the place now that we see him we see that he has been used mildly by god from genesis to revelation he is christ's right hand man there's a reason why jesus entrusted him to deliver the message of revelation about his second coming to john he didn't entrust it to anybody else well, that is the end of our look at angels. It's the end of our look at demons. It's the end of our looking at who the primary players are as we go into the book of Revelation. Now it's time to look at the actual verses and see what are the events, what are the timelines of things, what are the mysteries that we need to have solved and know so that God's people can survive to the end, to actually see the return of our Lord Jesus in the clouds. So as good as this was, it's just going to get better. Be blessed, and I look forward to seeing you again.